So does that mean that like the vast majority of your real wealth creation has been in like the ten, last 10 years? No, in the last like few years. But you were you you, you were broke. I was I would consider myself broke. I would say I started from zero <laughs> almost in 2016 when I launched the machine. I wouldn't say dead broke. I mean, you're a millionaire. You, 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 were you worth at least 10? I would say I was probably worth like, you know, 15 or 20 in that zone. So not broke. But to me, I was like Dude, broke. To, to a future billionaire, a millionaire is broke. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, say exactly what you just said to me when we finished our recording with Rob Deerdick. I said, I think that was the best episode of MFM we've ever done. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm just on a high right off of it. But I believe so. People can tell t- in the YouTube comments, they should tell us. I, to me, this was the best episode. We've done 400 something episodes. How many have we done, Jonathan? Something, something like 400 episodes. That was the number one, my favorite, the best episode we've ever done. The, from beginning to end, I'm shocked. So like you asked him, we, we started getting along really well. And you said, Rob, what's your net worth? And I was like, damn, is he going to answer that? And he <laughs> gave the full answer. We're not going to say it now, but it's somewhere in the middle somewhere. But he gave the entire answer where he broke it down. He talked about his... I, I'm just actually shocked that he said most of the things that he said. And it was amazing. In a great way. In a great he way. He told stories of two companies that he's built. And the stories were phenomenal. Uh, we talked about net worth, what he does with his money, how he thinks about investing. We talked about like how he kind of went from beginner at business and making all the mistakes to now being really sophisticated and how that all happened in a really short amount of time. We talked about his his house, the forever estate, the dream that he's been building around and how he does. It was, we we touched, it hit all the, the buttons. It had the inspirational, the tactical, the uh, entertaining, the humorous. It had everything that I like in an episode, but in one. So I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier right now. So if you use YouTube, whether you're listening on, on podcasts or you're actually watching us right now, let us know in the comments what you think or... If you're not a YouTuber, just tweet at Sean and I. It's uh, Sean VP, like Vice President Sean VP, and then the Sam Parr, and add Rob to it, and let us know uh, in Twitter on Twitter, or if you're a YouTuber, let us know there. I'm very curious what you guys think, and uh, tag Rob if you can. Give us a wave of feedback. I'm gonna send it all to Rob after after the pod to to show him uh, the the love because I know people are gonna love this. All right, without any further build up, here's the episode with Rob Deerdeck. Uh, all right, we're live. Rob, we, uh, Sean, you missed it because you're late. You're always late. And that's dear. That's his whole thing is timeliness. And he was talking mad shit about you because you were using his face and his time template that he talked about in the last pod. I am human optimization was the big the, the line from his last time he was on. That's been I think it's like in our trailer now. And uh, Rob, if you are human optimization, I am. Human on optimization. <laughs> I am the opposite. Yeah, and hey, look, the beauty of uh, you know time mastery is you don't. You're also it's time flexibility and and understanding that life is this living experience. But nothing brings me greater joy than to know a man that was using my time data for customer acquisition <laughs> and knowing that how much I collect my data and how how specific I am with mastering my time would be seven minutes, have me waiting for seven minutes <laughs> is what makes it even more, makes life more grand to me to know that for you knowing how much I respect and use my time so thoughtfully that you would steal a little bit from me, even as fun to me, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very fun. Okay, uh, that is well played. I appreciate that. Dude, we were talking about a bunch of stuff before you hopped in. But, uh, Rob, I want to talk about that in a second. But you came on, I think, two years ago or a year and a half ago. I don't remember. That was like your first. Every, I just reread the comments a minute ago. Everyone said the same shit, which is the exact same thing I thought, which was Rob's just a skater. Uh, he's He's smart and does good TV shit and all that stuff. But we didn't realize that he was this profound. And that pod, I felt like one is your, it was like you're coming out as like this like human optimization thing. Now I've watched you with so many other people mm-hmm. and you've, I've gone more in depth on some of your stuff. Is that true? Was that like your first time? Like, was that like the, the artist formerly known as Prince moment? <laughs> you guys get all the credit. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. 
Hey, because 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 let me give you this. You led out with trying to talk to me about you did you did no depth of research into seeing what I was up to. You let out <laughs> with some skate talk and TV talk, and then I went on like a twenty minute rant to un- so that you could understand the depth of how I operate. Yeah. Then the entire conversation changed for an hour. You know what I mean? And that 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 to me is like the funniest part of the experience was I said, OK, they didn't even they have no idea who they're talking to. Let me <laughs> let me lay this out real quick. And and but again, I, I'm so thankful that you guys the conversation turned to because it was also like I had been collecting the data using my rhythm of existence, but I'd never shared it before. So even then sharing it with you and then you guys reposting it, it really began to like create the wave. And then you guys put out a a little thing that was about what if Rob, how would Rob monetize his data? And so you put out this entire thing about like how uh, to build an app and, and what I would need to charge in order to create a business out of it. And it really started the wheels in me of like, like realizing that, man, I need to turn this philosophy first into then a usable digital product that's more intuitive, that's deeper than an app, that's actually a software that allows people to realize this level of harmony and overall happiness that I've created through this system and which has led to where I'm at today of continually pushing the philosophy forward and ultimately creating a software was inspired by you guys. <laughs> we get all the credit. That's nice. There's actually a couple listeners who, after they heard that, made their version. They were like, dude, he was talking about this. It sounded so awesome. He said he might share it, but we haven't seen it yet. So I just went ahead and I made my own version. It's it's linked to Google Sheets. It was kind of a janky version, but it definitely inspired several people to, I mean, many people to, to look inward and be like, you know, how am I treating my time? And it, it seems like you had the kind of the complete balance. You were like, I have my time that's with my wife and my kids. And then I have my work time and then I have my body, you know, you had it all. So I think that definitely inspired a lot of people to look at it, but it also inspired some people to try to build their own version of that tracker so that they could have the kind of the, you know, the, what, what gets measured gets managed that type of attitude around, around their time. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's, it's so much more complex than that, right? Because time's alive. And your time and experience, your present, basically your whole life leads to this present moment in time. And then the energy that you feel at this present and moment in time is ultimately the quality of your reality that you're in, right? So time ends up being this much more important aspect of learning to manage. And then you're changing all the time. The world's changing. You're selling companies. You're starting new companies. Your kids are growing, all these things. So like managing your time and how you stay balanced is constantly changing as well as you change. So it's this ongoing focus in my life that it's this con- constant assessment and, and adjustment to lead me towards a better f- probability of a better future experience. And that's what's difficult when somebody makes their own app. There's sort of a philosophy and a rhythm and a process that I think I need to that I'm creating in the software that makes it much more intuitive based off of the type of personality you have and the way your life rolls to get it to actually work. Because otherwise it just feels like you're making checklists and and making data and then it gets too difficult and it's over. Before you join, Sean, we were talking about Andrew Huberman. And the reason why we were talking about him is because both, I, I like to skate. Rob is a skater, hardcore, obviously, professional skateboarder and Huberman loves it and we were talking about that and I don't know if you know what Momentus is Sean but it's like they're they're one of the main advertisers on the Huberman pod and they're and it's Andrew Huberman says like this is the only protein that I like so obviously I bought a ton that's what I drink every day <laughs> oh. and Rob was like and I is it Jeff is he the CEO I, I'm supposed to talk to Jeff Jeff is the CEO um, yeah 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 I'm supposed to talk to Jeff because Ken Rideout introduced us who was also on the pod and anyway uh, Rob was like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's cool. It's amazing to see what how fast that business grew because of Huberman's, uh, you know, promotion, you know, you know, I co-founded that company not too long ago. And it's just crazy how fast it's grown. And we were like, wait, what? Rob, you co-founded Momentous Protein? 
Yeah, and look, and, and, and here's the thing with Momentous Protein. I co-founded it with Matt Wan in 2016. Um, the, when they brought it to me, he had a vision for creating basically the most premium supplements that the market had ever seen, the Ferrari of supplements. It was called Project One at the time. And um, Matt's was foregoing his first year of Harvard to build this company. He was 18 years old. And his father, uh, Mark Wan, had been one of the big investors in my professional skateboarding league. So I had a, a relationship with him and said, you know, I would do this project with his son. First thing we had to do was rebrand it, right? And really like create a name and, and a soul into what is the absolute pinnacle of supplements, momentous, right? And all the way down to where I even, you know, went through the whole process of even making that logo, you know, like to me, that <laughs> M is like this timeless, extraordinary logo, and, and Rob, that, that's you in Photoshop, or this is like a creative agency pitching you guys? How does that happen? You take it, make it well, tactical. Well, this is me literally an illustrator of the agency <laughs> sent some logos and me cutting up the agency's logo and being like, no, get rid of, there was a circle in the middle. I'm like, no, this is like, look at this. It forms like an M in a mountain, like, like get rid, like I literally cut and pasting in my illustrator, the momentous logo. Love it. And so we launched that company. And what happens? We don't sell a thing. <laughs> we don't sell a thing. What do we got? We got the most overpriced <laughs> like protein in the entire industry. It's like it's like 35% above like every other protein. Like it's like literally nobody buys it. Nobody buys it. Now you what do you got? You got an 18-year-old CEO. This kid doesn't even every single day is another thing of like, oh, that's what happens in business. You're you're if you want to talk about the headwinds of no man's land and the pain of launching a business with an 18 year old genius. Right. Because he's brilliant. But he was 18 and didn't even understand anything about a company. And you can't advise somebody into running a company. You know what I'm saying? You have to fight the fire, learn the battles to ever learn how to operate a company. Long story short, this, this business never got off the ground for years. And I finally, now he's older and like, I'm like, look, man, you've got to make a decision. Like you've tried everything. You've done all different types of partnerships. You've made all different types of verticals of product. It is the Ferrari of supplements. It is absolutely the purest and best. You kept it real, but you just can't find a market for it. Like you either have to sell it or you have to find somebody to merge with, but you got to move on. Like you can't like spend your, you're now 23. Like you learned everything. Go fig, take this skill set that you learned and apply it to a business that has a, a more, uh, relatively faster growing opportunity. What were the sales? What, what, what were the annual sales when you, when you had that conversation? Oh, I want to say a few million and just losing money year over year. And, and how so, much did you put in? Yeah. How, how much did you put into it to start? I put in, um, shoot, I want to say not much, like 200,000 and the first, like, like at the beginning to get it off the ground and another hundred thousand, 300,000 maybe. Do you split equity when you do that? Like a 50 and I got thirty percent of the business. Okay. Okay. So so now, um, man, raised so much capital any which way but loose. You know, now I'm on the board. I'm in board meetings. Like, and there's I'll tell you what, nothing nothing as painful as board meeting after board meeting when there's no revenue growth and you're just burning capital, <laughs> trying to figure out how you're going to tell a story to raise more capital to keep the dream alive. Um, that went on for a significant amount of time. We got incredibly diluted. And then the, it was just like, Hey man, you've got to make a decision here on like what you, what your life looks like. Forget about, forget about this company. Forget about this investment. Like you now, like, are you, you forego going to Harvard to build this company. So you essentially like stepped away from, from this big education, which always like in the beginning, I was like, this kid's too smart to go to school. Why he should just go start a company. He doesn't need to go to school. Like as I have kids and I'm older, 
You know what I mean? You know, like seven, eight years later, I'm like, man, I, I was like the bad uncle by advising him to not go to Harvard. And I'll do this company with you, gassed him up, right? Like, I, I think he should have went to Harvard in hindsight. Um, but again, like diluted all the way down. He went out and found uh, Amped, um, the business that Jeff was running at the time that I actually, man, I, I looked at in 2015. And almost did a deal to own half of PR lotion and, and the AMP product because of how much I believed in the IP uh, of of what they developed because it was built through this um, uh, uh, biopharma group that I was doing deals with back in fifteen in my early days of hustling and they merged and in that merger. Then they did a deal. Now they're joint companies that the whole company becomes momentous. And then they, they lock in that humor bin deal. And then the business exploded overnight. Overnight. Wow. Overnight. Do you know, and do you know how, how, how much did it grow by? Like, man, like 20 times, right? Like it, like it went like, um, it is it is now like poised to like now make a real run. And I would attribute it to the one for one like media to consumer that Andrews Huberman was to the product. Right. So we could never find an audience. It didn't matter how much like ad spends we did, where we spent it. We had deals with NFL teams and M MLB teams and all these athletes and all this stuff. But it was when it finally landed with someone whose core media is their authenticity in um, the science side of human optimization, then he's saying, hey, Andy has this massive platform. Then he's saying this is the very best supplements because they are, in fact, the very best supplements. When you tie those together, boom, that thing goes. You know what I mean? That's it. Amazing story. But what do I have now? I don't know. What do I have now? Like 4%? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've been delivered. So now, you know, call it nine years later uh, or a seven years later, I already gave up on the brand. Don't even like claim it. Like looked at it when they merged as an exit. And now it's just like completely exploded. But, you know, and yes, I'll get like a return on my 300,000. That would be significant um, to you know, probably a regular investor, but, you know, for me in the co-founding game, could have been, yeah. you know, I looked at selling that business for a hundred million in under five years and having 20% of it when I, when I measured that out in 16 versus, you know, selling it eight years later and making a million dollars wherever I end up getting diluted on the end and like, okay, cool. You got like two and a half times your money, but that's like, that's not why you play the game. Of venture creation that was i think that was my perfect so that might be my the favorite story that's ever been shared on this pod for a couple of reasons one you told it great two um it had it had all the the drama the elements uh to it and three you're very honest like um most people that come on this pod uh, were like, how much did you put in? They're like, ah, hand wave. We're, we're like, oh, it's doing well now. And then they're like, yeah, it's doing well. But they won't say that last part, which is like, yeah, but you know, it's been eight years. I got diluted. And honestly, I'll make kind of fuck all on this. And and I, I really the game I'm in, you know, that's good. But the game I'm in is to create to create X. Very honest. I I want people to appreciate that because that is so, uh, we do. We've done a hundred plus guests of people that are from all walks of life. People that are post-economic, they already made it. They have no incentive to kind of like to, to not fully be honest with, with the situations. And uh, it, it is very rare to hear that. So I, I really, really like that. I got two follow-ups for you on things you said there. The first is you said, you kind of think maybe he should have gone to Harvard. And I think this is an interesting question that applies to a lot of people, which is like, should I go to college? I kind of feel like, you know, people who make it, they're like, ah, you know, that's not where you learn it. You learn it in the real world. It sounds like you were kind of in that boat, but you said maybe you changed your mind as you've maybe matured or with your own kids. What What's the thinking there? What is it? He should have gone to Harvard because the company wasn't working or you came to appreciate something else about the value of college. I think I've come to appreciate the value of college above all. And as someone who quit high school and started <laughs> his first company at 17, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I think about the, but, but do you pre appreciate college or 
Harvard and top 20 colleges? Well, Harvard obviously has a higher level of like prestige, but, but what I never understood even back then was the looking at business in a multidimensional way, learning everything about business, understanding product and, and supply chain, understanding brand and marketing and customer, customer acquisition, understanding uh, sort of management and hiring and teams, like all of this uh, diff- and understanding sales and then understanding operational side, really understanding the financial side, knowing that all of those have to integrate into a financial model that you've got to believe you can execute because that's how a business actually becomes successful is when you project what you're going to do and you actually do it, not project a fantasy uh, so you can raise money, right? And I think that going to business school, you at least are leave with the fundamentals of that and, and have a general knowledge that when you step out into the real world and really try to build a company, you're you're at least going to have a foundation of what you're launching off of versus what he did, what I did when I was launching all these companies when I was young, all the way into my 30s, or what he did at 18. You're, you have such little general knowledge of how it all works because you're such an optimist, especially when you're really smart. You can figure things out fast, but there's just too many things that you don't know when it comes to like the complexities of building something like a business. You know? Right. And then uh, my second question was, do you, uh, this is a little nerdy on the protein side, but how did you actually go about creating the cleanest supplement? Because I've thought about this many times, which is uh, there is definitely a market for people who want this, the highest quality, purest grade, best, best for you product. And they'll pay the extra 20 bucks per bag to get it. Um, and when you when you look, I think the supplement industry is notoriously dirty. Like, uh, you know, the, the places where they make stuff, you know, you, it's if you test these things, they don't turn out very well. So did you guys do anything radical to actually achieve that result? Or was it just finding the right partner and then that was it? It, it was it was first like the people who helped develop it, right? We're all like the trainers and uh, for the 49ers and the Celtics, right? Then um, it's all the certifications that make the... Um, I can't think of their exact name, like grass and info sport, whatever these intra sport, I, whatever they may be, but these certifications that are very expensive, right? So now like the layer of and what does that do? Man, it just keeps putting pressure on price and margin, right? Because there's just a certain point where it's like, man, it's so expen- more expensive. Do even the people that really care, is it making enough of a difference? For the absolute premium. And to me, absolutely, we'd find a consumer. And that consumer never showed up until Huberman said to that audience, which converted Sam and now has Sam talking to Jeff. Like you, it's like <laughs> that level of authenticity. The product backed that up, but it we never found that level of media that could validate it to reach a large enough consumer base that would be willing to pay that extra amount of money. It's a dice roll when you, when you launch a business to do it like that, you know, uh, we need to get in the certification business, I think. Yeah. That sounds like the real business opportunity uh, yeah. in there. <laughs> uh, this is cruelty free certified ink. Uh, yeah, we, we will, right. we will certify everything <laughs> for y'all for, for the low, low price. By the way, it's funny that like Joe Rogan is like bro Oprah, but now Tuberman is like, Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz or something like of the, of this kind of like the guy media game where it's the, the, the doc, if the doc says this is the way to go, if he says this is clean, you know, he can move a lot of product, like an unbelievable amount of product in a short amount of time. But look, you think about, it's like when you think about the depth of him and how he approaches it, like, you know, how deep it is. So it's like you, he's earned that respect from you. And, and so it's like, you don't have to, you don't question whether or not Nike's going to put as much effort and innovation as they possibly can into a running shoe. You don't even look into the technology. You pick the color and which one feels the good, you know <laughs> that they're going to do all the work to get it there. Developing that level of authenticity is incredibly difficult, you know, because there's a lot of other people that are Huberman-esque that do not have his depth which in turn does not allow 
or his process that you believe in, which in turn doesn't allow them to carry the same weight that he does. And that was probably just a straight cash deal when you guys bought that ad spot, I would imagine, right? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I was involved in the company at that point. I'm not. Twi- I'm not entirely sure what the what his deal is, um, but whatever it is, he he got underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is, man, whatever it, is, it was too little. <laughs> Look, I am not privy to what it is, but whatever it is, they got a deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I just know that much. What? What are some other uh, venture creation that you've been up to? So that was one amazing venture creation story. You got me hungry for another. Do you got any other interesting things you've yeah, been and, cooking? And how many have how, how many have you even done? Have you done? You've done dozens of these. Yeah, I've done a bunch. I've done a bunch. You know what I mean? And and that's and here's the beauty of it too is like I've made so much money, right? That I'm you can play the game more honest. Right. But in your, you're not really, you're judging yourself off of your IRR, but you are not like, once you get to a certain point, like you're playing the game for the speed of the IRR and the scale of the IRR and its potential. Because when I started the game, I wanted to build 50 to 70 companies uh, and make, you know, uh, own uh, 25 to 35 and sell them for, between you know 50 million and 150 million and make 20 to 30 each but when you know you sell a company for 200 million and get you know 150 million you you're like well that's way more fun like <laughs> how do i how do i move this number from like making you know 15 to 30 million a deal to like you know 50 to 200 million a deal right you just begin to change as you're sort of evolving and what, do less deals? You want to do less deals, right? And then you you want to be much more focused on the opportunity and then like focused on all the lessons learned. Would I start a supplement brand with an 18-year-old ever again? I would not. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, and so let me give you an example of an, an opposite version, right? So um, I was approached by a really, really a seasoned CEO who had just built a company and sold it. it was a footwear brand called Greats. Okay. So yeah. I also owned a pair of those, man. Right. So, so you understand him as a brand and him as a brand builder and as a CEO, like, you know, and he had an idea he wanted to share with us and it was in the beauty space. And he essentially presented to us this concept of, um, Filtered shower water is this overlooked cornerstone of creating your beauty routine. Like your water is filled with all this garbage that dries out your hair and dries out your skin. It does all this stuff. Yet for some reason, there's no, no one's approached beauty and filtering the water, right? So we do all the, and, and again, so, okay, wow, this is super interesting. Then now you look at it from a business model. Right. Then it's like, oh, wow, now it's reoccurring revenue. So it's a single bit of hardware that now the filters have to be replaced. So now you've got this reoccurring revenue. Now it's a super experienced CEO that has, has a depth of knowledge in, in DTC. So it's not like, you know, a lot of times you'll find a, 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 an experienced CEO that came from retail who just, oh, it's, I want to build an Amazon business, right? Because retail's so hard. Like, Anytime you find people trying to transition to what they think is an easier way to create sales uh, is always a red flag. But it, but again, now he has the, the understanding, the knowledge, and now it's like, is this space valid? So we do the research. What do we do? We go and look at the entire space of all of the filtered shower heads, the entire market. It is tiny, 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 under a billion dollars, Right. And he wants to charge $135 for the unit, $35 for the filters. You know, you can go to Home Depot and get a shower filter for like 19 bucks. You know, there's like one premium one that's sold by a beauty company that's, you know, kind of chromey or whatever. That's up like $99, $100, but like no movement. And so when you look at that opportunity, you look at it like it's as clear as can be where it's like, man, this is either pure white space 
And there is a real opportunity to like make this matter in beauty and make a massive business. And, or it will like literally just not work. It is like so pure, but then the, the tantalizing side is, well, boy, if it works, man, it's like, it, think of the friction it takes to get a shower head in. But man, think of how low the churn will be on the subscription because it'll be way more friction to, to take it completely out to stop your uh, reoccurring like subscription every two months than it will and put back your old shower head. Like that made it this incredibly compelling concept. And, and by the way, for the listener, this is basically your shower head. So mo- I don't even I don't even think most people know this, but the shower head it's not that hard to remove. You can kind of do it yourself. And yep. what you're and, and it's Jolie. Is this Jolie? Is that how you say it? Jolie. Yep. Jolie. And you basically they give you a because I've seen this company. They killed it in year one. I think they did four million in sales in the first year. You basically they send you a thing, a new shower head. You they send you a wrench. You put it on there, and then you put little like filters and packets. And I think they smell nice or something like that. And they might have some type. They might have some type of uh, other good stuff in there. But the the premise is is that uh, for all the really hardcore health nerds, they're afraid of some of the chemicals and minerals that are in city water, and so they want this to be better. Um, and I have friends that have like um, what's that one uh, like charcoal water filter that's made <laughs> out of metal that every they they do that for their home. Like they do these really like. Ten thousand dollar project for their home, and what this product is is that for a shower head. Did I summarize that? Right? And think of that's correct, and it's the efficacy of it, right? And then how did they launch the company? How were they able to go to four million? And now this year, you know, they'll do close to forty million. Is that they um, they opened it up by like putting in your ad your your zip code so you could see all the contaminants in your water. Ah, nice. So how they did all their initial customer acquisition is they got all the data of what it cuz the sit, the the water departments have to report all the contaminants in the water and so they scraped all that data, you put in your zip code and then you got um a complete report of all the stuff in your water. That's how they did customer acquisition for months before they even had the product out. You know what I mean? Then they did pre-orders before it launched, right? Then what were we all hanging on for? What's that first quarter of churn? The churn was at like, you know, 1.2% like of the subscription. It's like everything about it. And then it was just growth month over month over month. Then like they just keep evolving. Like they launch an Air One in the grocery store. They have a giant display, and you can buy them an Air One, right? The it's like the entire process of how they did it overnight. Because you got to think, how do you value a business like that? That that, that business is valued at, at two hundred million plus in a year and a half. Because how are you? How do you really look at that? Where it's like, yes, it's selling hardware month over month. But then it is stacking subscription dollars. Like, so it is, it is this extraordinary hardware subscription service that is incredibly rare that has made it so valuable overnight. He built the company with three people. We're the primary investor. It's profitable and never raised another dime ever again. Chef's kiss. What size check you do on that one? Yeah, I did 800 in that one. So that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's substantial, right? For an early stage startup. I mean, you know, I, I will, I'll go, I go, I'm, I'm all over the place, but I'll go up to 10 million. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when I think 800, I think it's like kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> What's been the biggest bet? Like where, where have you plowed in something like 10 million into what, what type of bet was that? I did, you know, when I, um, my professional skateboarding league, my production company, uh, merged in cr- with Nitro Circus and created Thrill One Media. And then we sold Thrill One Media for 300 million, right? Of which uh, we got 200 million, right? And this was sort of like the, the layering in of my production deal. And then the group that bought Thrill One, I invested 10 million with them to buy me. Um, as, and then did a separate deal 
as it relates to having a bigger stake in the production company uh, that I sold and my league and the overall sports property. Um, because I knew um, during that, that transaction, I knew I was going to negotiate for a bigger television deal. So I basically leveraged, um, you know, my ability to go and get a lot of value for the company. So I got all this equity back. They just paid me, you know, close to 200 million. So I used 10 of it and <laughs> to invest in buying me so that I could, you know, turn around and hopefully make another, you know, you know, not, not nearly as much, but hopefully like another like 100 to 150 off of it a couple of years down the line. And, and when you say we, is that like Deerdeck family office or is that, uh, right, you don't right. have a fund, right? Yeah. It's just your family it's office. Just my money. Yeah. Like, no, I, this is all my money. So I, and I just run it like a family office and I just look at that as where I would deploy venture capital. Right. So if I just deploy capital into real estate and ventures that I have a much more control over and, or I have a higher leverage or position, uh, but it was amazing. Think about this. It, like in the closing of the deal, I had to not, uh, it was the most money I made in one shot, right? And the most, like I had invested at one shot in a venture. So with the like here on my, you know, closing <laughs> that deal in the Zoom call, it was the most I made and the most I invested in, in one, uh, <laughs> one, one here, here, with, you know, whatever, like I, whatever my like final check off on was it. But again, what are the stakes of it? It's whatever. You know what I mean? I look at it as it's fun and like I'm underwriting the business because I went and signed a massive television deal. So I'm underwriting that entire roll up like and it's amazing partners. It's Dana White and the, the Fertitta family who own the UFC. So it's like even being close to them and knowing them for so long uh, just makes the joy of of even partnering with them fun and exciting. And I dedicate very little time to it, right? Like I, I still, um, and help, help sort of adding the vision and how to continue to evolve it and grow it. But I, you know, continue to shoot television at an even much higher scale. Like now I'm shooting 336 episodes a year up from 252. Um, that's still at 4% of my time. Um, that's, you know, <laughs> essentially five hours a day, twi uh, four times a month for 10 months, right? Like is essentially what it is, but it's underwritten the entire roll up. It is, you know, a billion dollar television deal over a seven year period with the production and everything involved. I get all my talent money, but then I'm also leveraged into the roll up in the production company again to sell it again. Um, and it's, it's, it's just squeezing water out of a rock. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> you're looking at opportunities inside every deal. You know, there just isn't a world where I'm just looking at like, where are the ways for me to add leverage, create opportunity in each one of the ways that I look at every one of these deals um, each and every time. Who are some of your business uh, advisors, mentors, friends that are, helping you develop this muscle? Because, you know, you go from, and anything you want to do, you go from a white belt to blue belt. Eventually, you're, you you can become a black belt. And it sounds like, you know, when you started, you were more of a white belt like everybody. And now, you know, looking at structures, looking at ways to double dip, looking at ways to, um, you know, measure, okay, I want IRR, but also I should be thinking about the gross dollar amounts and maybe fewer deals, but bigger deals. Who have you learned a ton from that uh, that you, you you respect either as a friend or a mentor uh, on the business side? Man, I you know I don't think anybody plays the game like this that I know that's in my circle. You know, I think it's a it's that experience and it's that like continually looking at every deal multi dimensional, right? And I think like the gift that I actually had early on is I used to look at media and marketing multi dimensional. Right. So like in the early days, I would, you know, be able to look at like a television show and how are all these ways that I can monitor, monitor, uh, monetize it. Right. Like, how do I own the rights of media? And then I could sell that to different people. Like I always looked at opportunity multidimensionally, but I didn't understand how to build and create value in business 
So I never looked at business multidimensionally. And I just think I, at once I taught myself really how to look at business holistically and how to create and build businesses to sell, creating value that then I began to look at, you know, how can I see all of the opportunity in these different angles in order to, you know, create the most value for myself and a lot of times underwrite risk. You know what I mean? Like if I didn't know I was going to go and sign that mega television deal, I wouldn't have put in the 10 million. But right. I but then I said, well, what if I go and sign this deal? How much additional equity will you give me for my 10 million? Right. Then they're like, oh, if you go and get that deal, then we'll give you 12 extra percent. You know what I mean? Like then it's like, OK, now I'm like, you know, I just made my literally overnight made my 10 million worth like 60 million. And and underwritten it off of a deal that I'm going and making hundreds of millions of dollars to just do, you know, so it's like you're and at the end of it. And keep in mind, through all of this, I work less now than I've ever worked. (laughs) You know what I mean? Through optimizing my time and getting more and more efficient of how I use it. I work at, at, at about a 40 hour week to manage my family office, all of my venture portfolios and shoot television and a podcast. You know what I'm saying? All of that is without a 40 hour week, you know. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. What do you think you're worth at this point? Um, so you have, you have liquid and you have obviously illiquid. Um, what do you, what do you think the, the kind of the old, the N word, the net worth is, is at? Um, and do you, do you have a goal with that? And last podcast you go, I need to be a billionaire. Like I deserve. So like, yeah, where are we at? <laughs> Remember that line? It was a beautiful line. No, no, I don't. But that's really funny. It's like, I'm, you know, I was doing, cause you got to think like, you know, I have this, I, I in between our last call, I, I have this I hired an amazing CEO that came from a family office structure. I needed somebody that understood business, but understood sort of the dynamics of a family office, but was also young and, and excited to go on like a, a journey to a billion dollars, right? And so I have modeling for just my cash flowing assets that take me to a billion. Um, like forget about like any of your venture stuff and building out uh, sort of your pathway through the business side. Um, Like I have modeling out to the year 2050, like that I have fully integrated on all asset classes that I'm even investing in. Now, where do you make the billion dollars? You make it either slowly over time at compounding uh, or in big chunks, right? So if today I'm my net worth of all of my assets is a a little just under 350 million, right? That the the pathway, uh, there's the slow, long pathway to a billion. That's easy through compounding, right? Because because uh, the majority. What do you assume? Just are, like seven or eight percent. Correct, right? And, and with the, the the buildings now, you got to think about the way the buildings work and the real estate work. Is I'm getting five to six percent cash, to, like uh, tax free cash, but I'm still getting seven to ten percent uh, equity growth over the long term. Um, And, and some of those are, you know, so, you know, call it with the cash 15, 16% IRRs, but a lot of the buildings that I've, uh, sold, I ended up with like 35 and and 42% IRRs. And what do you do with that? You 1031 exchange it and, and you get new buildings on an ongoing basis. So like that real estate, even side of it, um, is compounding in a unique way. And then with my cash, you know, money markets are giving you 5% right now, close to 5%. And then I keep uh, a significant amount of liquid dollars in, in sort of new vein high yield funds that kick off around a blended 10% that aren't going to grow, but you get cash for your cash. You're making so much cash off of your cash. Then you're making so much cash a tax depreciated cash off of your um off of your real estate portfolio that you you know when you look at all of I look at that I call it the modern cash flow portfolio where it's just that cash is underwriting the expense of my life in the family office right 
Hmm. And so I don't even like when I have these big exits and when, you know, all the money I get made from TV, I look at all of it through the lens of how much am I actually making post tax per hour? So, okay, it seems like I'm making a lot shooting television so efficiently, but um, and how much time I actually work on the Deerdick machine and the actual uh, venture side of the business. When you look at long-term capital gains versus ordinary income, but boy, when you look at the amount of time I spend on that cash flowing portfolio in real estate, it's a couple hours a year. And so, so what do you, you have at, as a, as a dollar per hour goal? Like what do you, what is good for you? What is bad for you? Right. So like everybody, uh, has a, a, like, you know, if I do something that, that saves me a hundred dollars, I go return a blender yeah. to the store. That wasn't Wait, a saving of a yeah. hundred dollars. It was, it was a loss. I'm looking at yeah. a million an hour as the goal. You know, that's your goal. Like yeah. as it relates to energy and effort that's put into it. Right. And, and, you know, cause I, I, it's fascinating when you look at how much money I make from television and then what that ends up being like post tax and fees, even though it seems like a limited amount of time because I, and it's only 4% of my time, but seeing all of them through that lens it's a way more interesting way to view it all. You know what I mean? Because since it, and again, it goes back to time. It's like when you, because what life do you want to live, right? And, and where do you get time? Where can you buy time back? But ultimately, where are the places where you make the most money? And people don't believe in them. Like this idea of passive income. Uh, passive income is not buying a building that you've got to operate and you're constantly dealing with like trying to keep it rented and things breaking and trying to make decisions. That's not passive income in real estate. Passive income is when you give money to an operator and they give you cash back for your money. That's when you're doing nothing. Now, you're, you're, you, what you have to get good at is evaluating rules and, and, and creating principles for the type of operators you'd be willing to deploy capital with so that you know that they're world class and that you what they say they're going to do that they do which in turn all you're doing is reading statements and putting a little money together or putting a little bit of time to think through strategy future strategy a few times a year that's the the difference on the way you choose to get into an asset class you know and based off of the last pod you you were saying how like i i think you said i think you're 47 now right um, you said on the last pod that basically, I think you said into your late thirties, you'd screwed a whole bunch of shit up. I think when you were trying to raise money from, um, I forget the, the, the VC or PE company, but you're raising money for something and you're like, dude, my business sucks. I'm losing money. It turns out I'm, I was wrong. So does that mean that like the vast majority of your real wealth creation has been in like the ten, last 10 years? No, in the last like few years. But you were you you, you were broke. I was I would consider myself broke. I would say I started from zero <laughs> almost in 2016 when I launched the machine. I wouldn't say dead broke. I mean, you're a millionaire. You, 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 were you worth at least ten? I would say I was probably worth like you know fifteen or twenty. That's all. So not broke, but to me, I was like Dude, broke. To, to a future billionaire, a millionaire is broke. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, but but he he described it. He was like in my thirties. He's like I I spent this and this and you you said phrases like I had nothing and yes. I was and, and I but but I would tell you that the majority of this wealth was all created between two thousand eighteen and 2022 over that four year period, right? And now it's exponentially scaled, right? I don't even know, you know, when I think about sort of how I've, I, I'm, I kind of, I very conservatively um, value the ventures that get me up to the 325 zone. I could easily push those to, I could easily say those are, are, you know, push me closer to four. Right. And but it's also like then, OK, what is how do I want to continue uh, to create like bigger opportunities in the future? Because I'm always like five years into the future, the same way I understood in 2016. Here's the strategy. The strategy worked, only it was bigger than I had anticipated. Then all these other additional things had happened. I had the clarity of like, this is what I was going to do. But then that clarity, the universe conspired to create more opportunity that I capitalized off of and got to this scale that I could have never imagined in such a shorter amount of time. 
And all it does is make me see further and clearer on how I can get the scale even bigger, which leads me to believe compounding, I become a, a billionaire over time. Uh, but I, I believe I can create some ventures, including the software that I create that and the platform that I want to build to speak to that core audience that I believe I will be able to monetize it at a much higher scale in a shorter amount of time with my existing portfolio of assets. And if you Google your name, you'll see like you went on a little bit of a buying spree where you're buying like, I think four really, really nice homes Mm -hmm. in uh, LA. But I thought it said that you, I thought there was a quote saying, you're not going to live there. That's rentals. Um, A, is that true? And B, what type of real estate are you actually buying that you consider cash flowing real estate versus just personal? Yeah. So I would never buy a house to rent. That's like, yeah, I didn't think so. Um, I I, I thought it said, (laughs) I I, I thought it said that maybe it was like on the, what's it called? Like the dirt or like the real, something like that. Yeah. Really what I did and this, look, this is going to like, this will, this, this will give you, this is, this will give you an ex like clarity on how much money I had and how dumb I was in 2015. Okay. I like had met like my wife, like all I wanted to find was a forever home. I had like realized in 14, like I had begun to develop, like, like, like learning everything about business and everything. You got to think in 2013, I was dumb as dirt. I was at the bottom. I didn't understand business. I didn't understand anything. I hired all the consultants and all the groups and began to formulate everything I needed to learn to speak the way I'm speaking today and and the strategies of what money is, where do I want to invest it? Never even heard of multifamily units in 2014, right? Like all of this, I, I then took all of my money at the time. I had the, all the money I had to my name in 2015. It was $12 million in cash. Moved it all to cash like because I had money in all these different brokers and didn't know what it was. Here I am in 2015 with a vision for like how I'm going to create a venture studio, the Deer Deck Machine and the whole thing. And I'm looking for, you know, I just gotten married and I'm looking for uh, a forever home (laughs) or a place to buy. And I find the most heaven sent piece of land that God has ever created in a gated community in Beverly Hills. That is a like this gated community to a private road to a four acre promontory with unobstructed views of the entire LA basin, Hollywood sign, the most extraordinary property I have ever stepped on in my life and paid 10 million cash for it. (laughs) And then took, launched this dream with 2 million. You know, because I was like, oh, man, this is my destiny to build a house and live on this land forever. So it's just land. It, it was just land. Just land. Call it forever estates. And I, I have since. And so in that neighborhood, like where it is, I have bought multiple houses and remodeled them in the neighborhood while I continue to design uh, forever estates, as it's called. And. And kept it all these years, carried the cost, you know, 200 grand a year just to carry it, spending mil- like built a whole, designed a whole house with the architecture team, fired them, hired Sayota, <laughs> the best architects in the world out of South Africa. And we have just been designing and designing and designing. It was part of the vision of like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in forever estates. Like that's where I'm going to live. There is no better piece of land in the city of Los Angeles. It's the most extraordinary place home. I rented a house for three and a half years, bought a house for 6.5, sold it for like nine, five, two years later after remodeling it, bought another house for, for eight, put 2 million into it. This house that I'm in now is two doors down from the entrance to forever estates. So when I begin to build it, uh, at the, in the fall that I can be there every step of the way, but what happened? Wait, Wait, hold on. Begin to build it in the fall. How long are we of timeline are we talking? This has been eight years, and we're we're on yeah, begin for, to build it. This is the forever. This is the take forever estates. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and, yeah. So, and what 
world say to me? They're like, this is crazy. And I'm like, man, I'm going to live there forever. And when I build it, I don't even want to think about the cost. It's going to cost me 20 million to build. I don't even want to think about it. I needed to get to generational level wealth to even like, I didn't want it to be a burden. That's why I kept buying houses and kept working on the design. And then now you've gotten to such a scale. What's the strategy now? Well, I'm putting it into a trust. I'm paying cash for the house to build it. And then I'm going to pay rent to the trust. And then it's going to build an endowment so that this home can be in my family forever, but run it, be self-operational. That is so it doesn't have to be tied to the estate that it will be ran. And then there can be family meetings in forever estates for hundreds and hundreds of years into the future. Right. And you can't even get to that way of thinking unless you have kids, <laughs> unless you create generational wealth and unless you get to that time. But that all happened over five year period, you know what I mean. <laughs> that is an extraordinary transition to go. And it started. Through. It started with a horrible decision. I mean, ten, ten. It's terrible, uh, terrible. Uh, you took. Look, I put. I could have put ten. Think. I'm going to say. You know how many build? How much money I had invested in buildings <laughs> in 2015? One hundred thousand. One hundred thousand. I had invested one hundred thousand and was making you know, seven G's from that one. <laughs> and, and like I put, instead of putting 10 million into a cash flow, which would, I would have been set for life. If I would have put that 10 million into the buildings that I put back in 2015, that got like 40% IRRs, like, and we're kicking off like 9% cash. I would have been like set for life from the compounding and the cash flow of that one thing. Oh no. Oh no. I took 10 put it straight into a liability. You know what I'm saying? That now I'm carrying the cost of paying the taxes and double homeowner's fee because it's a double lot. So I'm just carrying 200 grand a year. Of, and, and then I'm paying all these architects on an ongoing basis to continue to design and develop it. Absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> You're a... Uh... You're amazing. Are you taking adoption? I, I think you're 15 years older than me. You know, I could be your your teenage. Uh, <laughs> you're taking your, applications. Your <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I want to go to Forever Estates, man. I, Forever <laughs> Estates for you is going to be more like a decade estate. It sounds like the way it's taken, but, <laughs> but that is like, hey, and look, even I'm. Hey, if it lasts forever, what's a decade, man? That's yeah, that's it, a drop in the like, bucket. It, but but think about it. It seems to me, I don't even. It's just another part of seeing my life completely in multidimensional because it's like it's my relationship with my wife and kids in time. It's the health that I have. It's how every part of my existence has continued to expand and get better. I didn't get better in just business. I didn't get better in just I got better in like all aspects of my existence on an ongoing basis. So that house, if I would have built the house I designed five years ago, I would have been so bummed because I got every six months, I would get a completely new design, get it in VR. And as I changed and thought about and got clear on what I wanted the future to look like and how I would want family meetings here in 200 years, like it allowed me to keep evolving and keep evolving to where when I finally got to this point where I'm just about to get the final permits, it feels right on time to me. I love that. Right. And, and it's like, I'm healthier, happier, wealthier, wiser. And I know that I'm just going to get healthier, happier, um, wealthier and wiser till the day that I die. And right now, what's my goal? 1 million hours of life, 114 years and 54 days. So where am I spending a significant amount of my wealth? understanding every single aspect of my body and having a very deep longevity plan that allows me to, to enjoy life and live it at a high level at the ripe old age of 112. Someone get to 114, just fall <laughs> off a cliff. I, uh... <laughs> oh my God, Rob, you're amazing. So I was going to ask you about longevity, like uh, per perfect segue, right? Yeah, I want to ask about that too. And what I was going to say is very similar to that, which is like, you know, a lot of people, wh wh when I sold my first business and had my first bite of like financial success, I was able to get physically fit 
it, it was definitely a little bit easier. I could hire some people, but also like I felt a little bit more calm and I had more time. Is this new focus on longevity and focus on all this stuff? Is that because you now are financially successful and have more time, or do you think that you always had this this bug? And what are you doing now, health wise? I have been doing it nonstop for as long for for twenty years. I got my first blood panel and started optimizing into my blood work in two thousand twelve. So for me, the what. Where a big transition was in 2015, around the same time, I had made the decision that like I was in the best shape of my life, but my body was always achy. And I had made this decision that I started having a doctor come to my house five days a week. And all I wanted to do was build a perfectly structured physical system. And there was no timeline to it. And, and really what it led to is triangulating a ton of different therapies, which in, but in the process allowed me to learn every muscle in my body, how the fascia system works, what are my neurological deficiencies, what are all of the things that I need to retrain in my overall system internally as it relates to leaky gut and, and blood-brain barrier, all of these sort of things that lead to inflammation, that lead to, to heart disease and all these different things that, that reduce your quality and length of life, I had been doing over a decade. So now the way I approach it is so sophisticated because I know every single aspect of my entire function holistically of my body, my mind, my time, my energy. So it's a different level. So what happened when I got to this scale of success I refer to it as peak top. It's the same psychological uh, chaos that happens to a drug addict at rock bottom, where like you finally make <laughs> a shift in you, where like you don't, you can't be a drug addict anymore and something shifts in you mentally. I finally got to, I'm, I, it happened to me on the other side, where like you started getting more and more disciplined and healthy that you all of a sudden were like, why would I ever not just be extraordinarily healthy for the rest of my life? And what happened from that point? I have not missed a day of getting up at 5 a.m. I have not missed a day in the gym. I have not missed one day meditating. I have not missed one day eating supplements, eating clean. I have not had a drink. I haven't had any sugar. I haven't had a snack. Any of that <laughs> for, since I hit that like nine months ago. The data that I shared with you guys as it relates to the quality of my life numbers, how I feel about my life, work, and health, zero to 10, and then my discipline numbers, what percentage did I get up at five, brain train, meditate, get in the gym, eat clean, and not drink, and take my supplements? It is 100% across this entire year. And then my qualitative numbers are at the highest they've ever been. So every single day, I wake up feeling extraordinary, right? And I grew into that. And then the more success I had, it, I didn't have to then decide I want to be healthy. I had been working when I, in 2016 when I designed my vision for my business and my financial success. I designed a vision for my life success and my health success. So what happened over the last seven years is I got better and better and better at all of it, which led to this euphoric state of where you have an incredible depth of knowledge of your entire reality and your current state and your future state. So you're just continuously predicting the future and creating higher probabilities of being healthier, happier, and wealthier in the future. While living extraordinary in the present. What's been like the 80-20 the of that? Like the, the, the things that have made the biggest change on your health? I mean, look, you, I, you not drinking, not eating sugar and intermittent fasting and eating a lean uh, protein and vegetable meal to me is everything. Is everything. Because you're just, your body begins to clean itself you feel better about yourself. You make sharper decisions. You go two layers deeper. Your emotions are more in check. Like things happen inside the family, different things that are uncontrollable. You're able to like, like control all of those better. That just pure diet alone in avoiding all of these like, like processed foods and, and alcohol, like 
and being committed to that will absolutely change your life because it gives your mind more depth to, to be able to execute at a higher amount, at a higher level in the limited amount of time that you have to execute. So have you seen this guy, Brian Johnson, what he's doing? Look, I look at Brian Johnson as this guy's outrageous. It's too much, but I withhold my <laughs> judgment because I'm our, I like, if I would have told myself five years ago, hey, this is what you're going to be doing, I'd be like, that guy's crazy. So I look at, like, man, I, I feel like Brian Johnson's crazy, but I'll probably turn into Brian Johnson in like seven or eight years. You know what I mean? He's wild, man. He's wild. <laughs> yeah. Brian Johnson just has that look. You know what I mean? He looks like a futuristic, like, Omiba, you know what I mean? Dude, like, that's what I was thinking. I looked at him the other day. I'll go. All he needed, all he needs to do is tan. If he tans, everyone be like, "This guy is amazing." Point. He doesn't that's tan, and they're point. like, "You're you're a vampire, bro." No, <laughs> just he looks like AI. All like the new AI versions <laughs> of people like coming out. He looks like an AI person. He might not even be real. He might not even be real. You know? He's a, he's a mid journey. <laughs> but I do look at like that aspect because you've got to think about anything. Think about the way that I talk about business. It's knowledge and experience and an understanding and then a continual evolution and growth of understanding the whole, like applying that to my relationship with my wife and family, applying that to my health, applying that to business, applying that to investment, applying that to building my, my family office, like all of that way of thinking like is, is based off of gaining knowledge to take something from not understanding it, feeling difficult to then making it easier, then continually optimizing, right? You're just incrementally making it all better. What, what are, I love the way you think and I love the kind of pursuit of greatness and pursuit of excellence for yourself and, and having a vision for yourself. Um, I also know that it's inspiring, but also hard to relate to perfection. And so I'm curious, what are the current flaws or bugs in your software that you're still debugging? We all have some bugs in our software that's running. We, we're, we're, we're hunting them down and we're trying to squash them one at a time. What are some that are still still in your your system? It might be in business. It might be in health. might be in, you know, for me, oh, you know, a nice bag of chips is still a, b a bug in my software. Uh, you know, maybe something, oh, sometimes when I'm with my wife, I'm not as present as I should be. I'm on my phone, but I know that's not really me and who I'm going to be, but I'm, I'm still catching up to myself in that way. What are some of those for you? I, you know, I, and this is going to sound like extraordinarily. Um, <laughs> don't say it. I tried to help you, man. I, I tried to serve uh, you up a way to be uh, vulnerable here. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> no, again, I'm not. There is no. There is. This is the I, I'm not I'm not racist, but this is like you're, you're <laughs> teeing this up. Yeah, no, no, I'm not. There is no like to me. It is like I still get triggered. Like, and we'll get angry, right? Like hmm. I will get like when my expectations are mismanaged at a high level, I'll, tr I'll get mad and get like and snap, right? Like I have, I'm not even kidding you. Like I am trying to like, like, even when I get triggered, I'm trying to stop the triggers, um, to avoid like saying something like letting it come out, right? Like I'm really, but I still feel the trigger. My goal is to get to like, don't even let things trigger you. Like when you let people get angry, but you got to think part of like the evolution is like, there's certain people in your life that do that to me that I had to let go of, right? And continually optimize for those people. And this is the, this is embedded in my soul. This is embedded in my soul. When I feel stuck, when I feel stuck, when I'm working on like trying to do deep work or doing, and I feel stuck, all I want is pizza and wine. All <laughs> I want is pizza and wine. It's not even like a matter of like, like acting on it. It's like my soul feels like it needs, it needs a glass of like wine. And it's like, cause whenever I get stuck, it's this, this psychological thing of like, just fuck, let it all go, let it all go. So even though I don't act on it because I've just evolved beyond it, I still, when I get stuck, I, the feelings are, are existing there. But, but I'm telling you, it's the, you know, the commitment of where it went hundred percent health and no alcohol and no sugar and that level, it, it eliminated so many things. It eliminated me being like, you know, short with people, it eliminated me like making rash decisions, right? Not thinking through stuff and just, 
like shooting from the hip, you know, which is a, a recovery. You know, I used to say like, you know, Deer Deck Enterprises, our money's fearless, right? Because I would uh, in, like invest so recklessly when it was really our money's dumb. But that reckless, like, let's just push it forward. Like, let's just, let's just start it and go for it is still something that I fight on an ongoing basis because I'll get excited and energized and see it and be like, let's do it. And I've got to control that impulse just to that I've that I've learned to control in this state at a much higher level. But there are very little. And here's the thing. I, I look at it as like how Kobe was never like was relatable to me because it was too much discipline. And how Tom Brady, like, man, why would you not take the off season off? Like, like I used to look at that as this impossible level. And to me, like, I know that I'm I'm reaching this unrelatable, unattainable place. It's why I put out a podcast uh, earlier this year that was the most unrelatable podcast, part one and part two, because I just <laughs> laid out the depth of like actually how I'm operating and what I've learned along the way to get to this level, because I do want to, I want to be the proof that you can get to a place where you never get angry, you never have a negative thought, where you are completely harmonious and balanced in all your relationships and time and health and happiness, where you are happy and filled with gratitude seven days a week, every single day, ev even under unexpected duress. I, I'm living it and I know it's possible. I want to continue to be proof that it is. Then I want to build the products, services, and tools that other people can use to get to this level and this feeling, because to me, it is heaven on earth. It is true happiness is really the output of this existence that I've created in a relatively short amount of time. Let me, uh, let me run this trend by you guys that I'm seeing, and it's related to this. So I live part of the time in New York, part of the time, most of the time in Austin, Texas. And I also own a ranch out in Texas. And what I'm noticing is that in Aust Austin, it's almost like LA a little bit where we have all types of health freaks. You know, it's like, it's really cool to be around those types of people. And I eat really healthy as well. And I'm noticing that my extreme health friends, they're doing something like that, like a redneck family, like where I grew up, what they used to do, which is they buy a cow. So like you like go in with either you or your neighbor and you go and purchase a cow and someone slaughters it. And then you get like the whole cow for the year. And I noticed that Zuckerberg, I think two years ago, he made this commitment that he was only going to eat what he killed or I think even grew. And I'm noticing that my health friends are doing this now. And I've seen a lot of tweets r recently where people saying like, you know, I'm eating healthy, but I still feel bad. But when I go to Europe, I feel good. And I, I did some research. There's the FDA and the European, uh, the EU, how they like measure food. It's a little bit differently, like the, the preservatives and things. Anyway. Have you, I know you're into health now and I know you invest in a lot of health and wellness stuff. My prediction is that in the next five or 10 years, I think we're going to see a couple brands where you can buy meat online. I'm even seeing people like revolt against like Whole Foods meat. Have you, are you eating? And so it's like something I've been thinking about is meat. Have you been, do you eat just meat off the shelf from Whole Foods or do you get it from somewhere special? Because I think there's going to be an interesting brand that does this in the next five or 10 years. Yeah, look, like, I, my meat is not so special to me. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, when I, and so how I do it, how do I do it? I get, um, meal delivery seven days a week. Right. And I from, get from which brand? Uh, it's just a local chef here. So okay. I get, that's all organic, right? Grass fed. And so I get a salad. Grass fed beef. Yeah. Yeah. And so That's, it tastes so bad, man. Yeah. And, and so look, so, so to me, I'm, uh, that's my baseline. And then I have breakfast Wednesdays with my wife. I have Friday night pasta with my wife, Sunday night sushi. Like I have sort of the rhythm of dates that I take my wife on. And so when I look at that particular protein, if you will, at this stage, like I'm, I look at that as, as 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 much as I'm willing to dedicate into what's in my body until I can get to a point where the data shows me the impact 
of having Daisy in the backyard and me cutting Daisy up and slicing <laughs> off a rib is going to deliver more nutrients that's going to add to a, a longer, uh, um, higher quality of life. I would need the data to take me there one day as opposed to getting that nuanced in the delivery of the quality of that protein, where at this point for me, that's enough as it relates to what I'm capable and my personal capacity can dedicate to the quality of the food. You know, I think this is going to be a thing, Sean. If you do not know, there's a company that just raised money from Peter Thiel. It's called Coop. And they're making the Tesla of chicken coops. So normal people can have a chicken coop in their backyard. Have you guys that? Sean, I'll, you not, I'll like, believe any trend. Yeah, that, that coop guy, he's the eye crack guy, right? Same guy. Yeah, AJ. Dude, I'm so fascinated with this. Me. Look, listen, listen. Right now, fundamentally, would you have your own chickens that you slaughtered and ate chickens if it was No, it's for the or... eggs. It's 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 for the eggs. Yeah. It's for the, the eggs. Eggs, <laughs> eggs make sense. Bro, you just, you, you, you just told me that a shower head company is going to be worth billions, okay? <laughs> and you just bought a $10 million piece of land when... So, look, <laughs> we... You might have an air in your judgment. Things happen. <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I know your biggest weakness is you sink in the shower, but come on. Yeah, look, for eggs, maybe, but beef, I, uh, you know, I, but, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, you guys, when you look at trends on an ongoing basis, you, you refine your lens of like the things that were improbable that ended up working when they're harder to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think my even lens is is always ties back to the probability of the unit economics and the reoccurring revenue aspect of it. You know, like I look at it so much more through that lens, because even when I think about the coupe, right, if you're selling a single unit hardware, uh, now you've got this incredibly small um like like customer base in the very beginning that are the ultra healthy and then they're they're, they're it's like a, a mattress like in the direct to consumer mattress game as soon as they buy right. one they don't need another one for for you know 15 years right like it's it su would suffer that same sort of consequence versus five years ago coop would get you know, a hundred million dollar valuation based off of like, there's going to be coops in every house in the world. It's innovation. It's like the Tesla of eggs, you know? So right. I, my lens isn't as refined. And I always go back to like, like how much revenue the idea can create from a long-term value perspective um, versus those, those tough uh, hardware businesses that are minimal margin and you sell one, you know. So what what trends interest you now? Where what do you think is going to be popular in the next five years? And where are you inv investing your money for? Uh, what interesting trends are you looking to invest in? Yeah, look, I don't invest in anything. I invest in real estate and and businesses that I create. And right now, I haven't even uh, invested in a new venture since Jolie. Um, you know, because to me, I'm I do think when I look out into the future, like like as it relates to the type of stuff that I would do would still be related to biofeedback, um, you know, health customization, all of these things that, that help lead you uh, to optimizing your overall health and well-being. Um, you know, I do think, you know, uh, like, you know, you got to think those, those glucose monitors that have, that sort of come out to kind of give you an indication of like what your blood sugar is doing when you're eating food. Um, that they're going to evolve that to eventually become dopamine and cortisol. And it's going to end up being a cornerstone of like how you even your life is actually feeling based off of what your your blood is saying in real time. I think that's going to be something that really makes a big impact on the world. Um, and, and to me, I want to I want to time into creating the existence management system that helps you manage how all of it fits together to lead to your present moment in time and help you optimize for guiding your life to creating higher energy present moments that you use with purpose. And whether that's to, to be on your phone and watch TV with your wife because you're tired or it's um, for you to be ultra present with your kids so that you can actually experience it or 
you want to be able to design, use the present to design a better future for yourself. Like it's really about how do you become this healthy, develop healthy and understanding and the knowledge of yourself, develop the ultra awareness of everything about you so that you can continually live a consistent state of joy because feeling joy over long periods of time is what it creates the feeling of happiness. Sean, we could wrap up with whatever you want to, but I know that people in the comments are going to be like, why is that douchebag bringing up me? What the fuck? Uh, they're already good. I already know they're going to flame me in the YouTube comments. That's, that's all right. I, hey, that's I was okay. just curious. <laughs> Rob, uh, I wanted you to, can, can you can you finish with a two minute crash course on something I've been uh, look, interested in? You, and you know very well, which is production companies. So I noticed, uh, I don't know anything about Hollywood or pr TV production, but I, I, my, my ears perked up when uh, I forgot who it was they bought um, Reese Witherspoon's production company for some hundreds of millions of dollars. Then uh, I saw that Peter Chernin from uh, the Chernin Group, he's doing a roll up of production companies, he's put in a billion dollars to work rolling up production companies. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I read some interviews and he's talking about why he thinks there's a you know growing and sort of insatiable demand for content. And then, um, you know, I just look at people who create Netflix shows. I go look at, uh, you know, oh, Love is Blind is num ranked number one on Netflix. Who created this? Oh, it's a small production company. Like, is this like the startup game where you, you create the next hit show and you become a billionaire? Or is it a, a ruthless business? To, uh, can you just, just describe what creating a show or creating a, tel a production company is like and if that's a good business to be in or not? As someone who um, sold their production company for 200 million and who like had an offer on the table um, that fell apart for 400 million recently. Um, it is the worst business that you could ever get in in your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and I'll explain to you why. It is a shoot what you kill game and the distributors control all of the money. So like in your... You have a hit show and you have this flourishing production company and then the show gets canceled and your company's worth zero, mm. right? It is. And then the problem with shows is like they don't pick them up for long periods of time. I have a five-year, 1,680-episode order of television. It is unprecedented in all of production. It does not exist. But why is it hard for me to turn around and sell that? Because it's one single show. And now they look at the, and it's so expensive because it's made the, the production company so profitable. But let's just say that didn't push you away. A production company is built like this, right? You, you've got to build the infrastructure that allows you to have your camera equipment, your finishing equipment, your licensing for your music. You've got to basically then go and and give a budget to a network who's going to give you 500 grand for an episode and now you have got to figure out how to pull uh 20 to 30% of that in margin right so it gets in, incredibly difficult to do and the only way that you can do that is look at all of the different ways that you can scrape margin out of that budget by owning vertically integrating so a lot of times there'll be people that that you know, have, um, you know, television shows and they just get paid an executive producer fee, right? So they will make a lot of money. Like Jeff Tremaine, uh, who is one of the executive producers on my show, you know, makes millions off of ridiculousness and doesn't just off his executive producer fee, nothing. Where we rolled in our pro executive producer fees, then built out the entire post and finishing and music division to push our margins up to be able to, to create a sellable asset. Then we had multiple shows and then the, um, it, you know, the call it the long-term sustainability of ridiculousness created the value that allowed us to sell it. Right. And yep. so even if you, you launch an a production company and you have love is blind and it's a hit show, you're not making that much money off of that show. You are now hoping to stack shows and then end up pulling off of that margin that you get to split, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then you trade on EBITDA, 
right? So when you sell the business, you're trading at like, you know, six times EBITDA, five, six times EBITDA. And then a lot of times now they won't even buy you outright. They will partner with you, incentivize your long-term earn out because they don't want to just like pay you, you know, five times, six times your EBITDA. And then all of a sudden, like the show goes away, right? They And, and you were the creative force behind getting new shows, right? So it, it's a lot more like complex. And, and when you think about like the big dogs doing it, they're looking at it more from they're buying the creative minds that are making the new content all the time. So when you, if they believe long-term in content, they're just, and when you look at that aggregate, you can have a couple of them slip and have a couple heroes in there. And when you see all those together, you can bet that that thing's gonna generate a ton of cash because the industry itself is built around being incredibly lean and then um, being, being profitable because they're only worth their profitability and then they can accordion. You got a big show and all this staff and the show goes away, boom, you bring it all the way back down because you you put so many people under under the show itself. So that's where the bigger vision is for them to look at. And is there an opportunity um, for creatives and people in the space in this day? Yes, because Endeavor's doing it, Churnin's doing it, a lot of people are doing it, but it's extraordinarily difficult and and the gatekeepers are the distributors, the Netflix, the Paramounts, the, you know, you can attempt to create your own platform and distribute it yourself, YouTube, digitally, whatever it is, but it's expensive and difficult to build audiences. And then you're really looking at those distributors as the gatekeepers to the quality of the asset that you're creating and whether or not someone will make it to decide that you're worth the purchase, all of that. Incredibly difficult, in my opinion, to to make happen. You know? Perfect answer. Exactly what I was looking for. Rob, this has been amazing. Oh Better than God. part one somehow. Uh, where should people follow up? Where do you want them? You want them on your pod, your Twitter, email list? How can people get more, Rob? You know, Rob's just at Rob Dyrdek across mm -hmm. social, you know, on a dot com. And just, you know, I got billed with Rob. But really, I'm not out pitching nothing. I'm just out trying to figure it out, keep evolving. But one day, I'm going to come back on with my software when it's done. Well, first, I'm going to send it to you guys first. And, and then when the book and the philosophy are out and the software is out, then it's going to be like, how do we convert the listeners into changing their lives from being erratic into harmonious, high-quality existences with the right. existence operating system, you know. But that's off in the future. Now I'm just <laughs> glad to reconnect because I'm thankful for you guys um, for kind of s starting the spark of the whole thing. And, and really, I'm even thankful for you posting all the data and using the customer acquisition from the stuff that I sent you. You know, I sent you all the new stuff. <laughs> Sam, to, to you know, do you know what happened? Sam might not know. So basically, he came on. He did the rhythm of existence. He sent us the, the Excel PDF. We post on Twitter. And it was kind of over. And then like a year later, I was like, all right, I'm going to start building my email list. And I was like, um, how do I get fans of the show, the, the, the like-minded people? How do I get my type of people to subscribe? I don't just want any subscriber. I want the right type of person. And I was like, what would the right type of person be into? And I was like, oh, dude, the Rob, the Rob Deerdeck, the that that rhythm of existence sheet, the time tracker, I think they would be nerding out about that. Like, that's my type of nerd. And so we put it up as a lead magnet, which was like, hey, come, you know, put your email in and get the he'll share his uh, thing with you. And uh, we start spending a bunch of money. And Rob emails me like, I don't know, six months ago. He's like, bro, you're blowing me up with this sheet. Uh, you know, it's all good, but you got to update the photo. You're using the wrong photo from, from over here. And so we updated the photo. And I was like, oh man, I feel bad. We took the whole ad down. We started put, putting something else up, but it was a, <laughs> it was a, hey, a moment of embarrassment. Bad. Don't feel bad because it, it, to me, just perpetuates like, like, for me, it just continues to push the narrative of like level of discipline and commit and data driven. So and Rob, you, you said well, you, you was, said you subscribe. It was you, good you, you, in that we, yeah. we we were preaching your gospel and makes yeah. you look like a badass. So there's nothing bad there. I just should have asked you first, and I yeah. had forgotten to do that. Or I didn't do that, and that's why I felt yeah. embarrassed. I was like, oh my bad. <laughs> yeah, don't. Hey, I appreciate it and thought it was funny, but I was also like, like this is great. Then I was like interested in the data. 
from your perspective of like, okay, well, I wonder how many it converted just to kind of understand like how many. Well, there was nothing to convert to, right? Like since you had the DocuSign, it was just the views of the uh, the the PDF was like what I was interested in, right? And yeah, so, I, don't, I don't think it ran for too long. I think it had maybe 5,000, 10,000 hits, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, a good, a good amount for sure, but um, not. Yeah. And, not and again, maybe that. I love that as just another data point from my perspective. That's why I was like, hey, use the new stuff, make it feel more inviting, like right. make it feel more exciting for people to see it to because I want to, you know, continually to perpetuate it. But again, I am. And R- Rob's I, getting I, triggered now, care. by the way. This is him working on that trigger of not getting angry. You no, know, I was talking but, to somebody yesterday about triggers. They were like, they're like, man, he just pushes my buttons. And I was like, dude, you're like a Blackberry. You're just covered in buttons. I was like, you, you, the problem is not that he pushed a button. You got so many buttons to push. Like you want to be an iPhone, no buttons, nothing to push. And what, what can yeah. someone do to you? Now you're unstoppable. Yeah. Right. And it's possible for everybody mm-hmm. to get there. Awesome. Well, we, we appreciate this, dude. Uh, last time, maybe video and audio had like half a million views. I have a feeling this is going to uh, crush it. So we appreciate you. Okay. Till we meet again. Till we meet again. See you guys. Thank you.